the 90% question challenge for one week, not three days, one week. And the challenge is that for the next week, starting now, um, try to make 80, uh, try to make 90% of what you say a question. Elliot, thank you for coming on the podcast. Long time fan of your work and really appreciate you taking the time out to be here today. So thank you. In person in Miami. Nothing Take better. it away, Danny. <laughs> I'd love to start with your freshman year of college where you go to the RA and you see that he's screen printing t-shirts. That was, it sounds like from doing research, a pivotal moment in your life that unlocks something. Can you speak to it? The reason our story is such a good story is not because of how successful we are or how smart we are. It's the opposite. It's how relatable we are. So I applied to seven colleges and I got into none of them. And I still have all of the rejection letters. I actually ripped them all to shreds. I was so upset. And my mom like taped them back together. Maybe I taped them back together, but regardless, I have them and they're taped together all in shreds. And I got into the University of Wisconsin, uh, like I applied really late and I got in through tennis because I was a good tennis player growing up. That was like my passion. I'd spend hours a day. And, uh, but when I got to college, like the reason I didn't get into seven colleges is not because those colleges were wrong. It's because uh, I wasn't a very good student. I wasn't passionate about studying. And it turned out the reason for that is I just never found anything I was excited about or interested in. Um, like when I read about entrepreneurs growing up and I read about a Steve Jobs type character, it was just too unrelatable. Like I, I couldn't understand how you could make the leap from a crappy student like I was to someone who like really got interested in something, went all the way down the rabbit hole and just like totally latched on. And then this was like their absolute, you know, truth and purpose. So when I got to Wisconsin, I spent the first semester, um, besides being on the tennis team and, you know, working hard at tennis, which I enjoyed, just getting bad grades, not liking classes, um, not understanding how I would ever, you know, make it in the real world after school, um, thinking about what internships to get after freshman year. I mean, absolutely typical of every single student. Absolutely, I did not have any skills um, above and beyond any of the other, I think like tens of thousands of students that go to the University of Wisconsin in Madison. So at the beginning of my second semester of freshman year, you know, like early January, everyone went home for Christmas break. And I came back, it was a few days in, and the RA, which is the resident advisor, this is like a person who gets to live in the dorms for free and eat for free in exchange for kind of looking out for the freshmen. So maybe this guy was like 24, he was a grad student. The you know RA, in order to pay for his tuition, because he was smart enough to get to live for free in the dorms and eat for free, in order to pay for his tuition, which was like a thousand bucks a month, he invested some of his money, maybe 400 bucks, to buy a screen printing press. He knew how to code, so he built his own website. Or maybe he you know, used a Wix-type website and didn't know how to code. Um, and uh, then he was really into Ultimate Frisbee. And I guess there is this very niche community. They say the riches are in the niches. But there's a lot of people who play Ultimate Frisbee all over the country. And he came up with this little t-shirt business making funny t-shirts about ultimate frisbee so uh like an ultimate frisbee one thing you know you can force the plays to the side force them left or right because people are righties or lefties so there's this expression called like hold the force and i guess you know <laughs> you had like uh these hold the force t-shirts um you know also with like the star wars you know reference and um and so this was little business and he made a thousand bucks a month. And I didn't know this, but one day I was in the dorm and he was two floors below me. I was on the seventh floor. He was on the fifth floor and I was walking down the hall and I think his door was open. I looked in and uh, instead of kids playing video games, watching TV, studying, chit-chatting, whatever, 
he was screen printing t-shirts and it's like a, you know, a big machine. You're standing over it there. You have these stretched out t-shirts on them and he's like clearly printing things. It's a screen printing press. And I just said like, what are you doing? And he explained what I just told you. And I like the first question I said is that's really, really cool. Like who, um, who do you work for? And he's like, no, I have my own business. And I was like, right. But like who, who hired you? He's like, no, 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 like I have my own bank account. I invested my own money. I, you know, make the thousand bucks a month. And I, I, I couldn't fathom this. Um, and I called my parents. I said, is it really possible? Like somebody has their own business? Like he's basically my age and he's telling me he runs his own company. And this is in, you know, 2006. So there had not been uh, like the iPhone app store revolution yet. There was not a generation of people creating their own startups for super cheap. And, you know, whether they're doing drop shipping or selling through Amazon or have their own, you know, Shopify storefront, like these are all things that any person listening to this can do. There's a world of possibilities. He had kind of hacked out the pieces. And that was the moment where I was like, oh my gosh, this is it. Like I can start something, I can go, I can like build my own dreams. What was the first dream that it must've been a screen printing business? Yeah, yourself, I, right? I teamed up with him. I said, why don't we, you know, you've got your um, funny t-shirt business for Frisbee. Why don't we try to do other funny t-shirts? And so we spent a year trying to launch uh, like a funny t-shirt business that didn't end up working for a variety of reasons. Um, you know, overordered inventory, <laughs> spent too much money. Um, I was just can't, he's totally clueless. And then the next year, and now I was going into sophomore year, we started a creative consulting business. So the idea was our college campus had a main street, like so many college campuses, and there's all these stores on the main street. And we thought, you know, the store owners, they're a bit out of touch with the perspectives of the students. So we'll get groups of students together to brainstorm marketing and ideas for the store owners. And then we'll do these kind of like listening sessions, creative brainstorming, and we'll pitch this product, like a store owner can pay us a few thousand bucks for a creative consulting um, contract and we'll package all the material and then they'll know how to market and build their brands on the, st on the main street, State Street. But we spent uh, like months designing the product and the offering and getting students who would want to be in our creative consulting group. And then we like pitched all the stores and we failed to sign up any clients. Oh, wow. But like in this process, like I would go to door to door. I'd try to go to like local, you know, networking events in the University of Wisconsin. And I was like full on, like I was loving it. But zero clients. I got zero clients, zero revenues. We didn't even do a, we never did a creative brainstorm. We, we never, uh, and it didn't work. And so I spent that whole year, and I think like from the outside, it looked like, wow, I've now spent almost two years in total failure, like basically never made a dollar of revenue. I have two failed businesses. I've burned all my savings, and my grades have continued to suffer. But in reality, I was working like 16-hour days and like didn't feel like work. It was just, I was finally learning. I was, I was by the way, for the first time in my life, reading books, I was, there were some courses now I was super interested in because I understood how I could apply the lessons from those course courses to my life. Like the economics courses now made sense to me. Mm. And there were, there was just tons of reading online I was trying to do, I was, you know, trying to learn about sales, trying to learn about marketing. So in reality, after these two failed years, I was more primed than ever. And then probably any other kid at, you know, in my year at school, you know, to take the next steps forward. It, it's funny because you're what happened to you, you saw the screen printing business, but something inside of you was like, oh, there's a spark here. A lot of people heard about that screen printing business as well, but not a lot of people had that feeling of like, oh, something's there that I need to attack or that I need to, that it speaks to me. W why do you think, what was it inside of you that really got lit up when you heard about the screen printing business? It just seems so exciting to be able to build <clears throat> to be able to build my own company. Um, when I was on the tennis team, I took a recruiting trip to school and I met all these seniors on the tennis team. And you can imagine I was a senior in high school and they were a senior in college and they were so mature and I idolized them. I thought, wow, like I, I was nervous to even ask them questions. 
And then fast forward a year, I was a freshman in college and they were effectively a freshman in the real world, you know, and they had these kind of menial desk jobs. And they came back, uh, one, of, one of them came back in my freshman year. And I said, wow, like, how is it, you know, out working? Like, and he was like, don't go out there. It's the worst. Like, try to stay here in college however long you can. Like, you don't want to go out there. It's so competitive. He said, look, like, we're one school, and we're not even a great school. Like, we're not even in the top 50 of colleges. And then we have tens of thousands of people. And imagine there's dozens and dozens of other schools, and that just this year. Imagine the last 30 years, they're all competing against us, and it's zero sum, and, like, just don't go out there because you're going to be screwed. And he's like, and I know you, you know, you're not that smart. Like I'm smarter than you. So if I'm not doing well, like how could you do well? So just stay here and enjoy it. And so that, that had like a, a real, I think it's like a real impact on me. Like he, he was trying to genuinely give me advice, like just enjoy college because it's brutal in the real world. But I think that, that planted a seed that like I'm in big trouble if I try to follow a traditional path into the real world. I don't have the grades. I don't have the the book smarts. I, you know, I'm not going to fit into a corporate job. And then I'm just going to also be competing against everyone else. So that got me thinking, like, what could I do? Do so when I saw this guy screen printing T-shirts, I realized, like, over the next couple weeks, like, wow, this is it. Like, I could actually build my own thing. What's the story about you looking at everyone going in the same direction and then deciding you're not going to go in that direction, you're going to go the other way? What At what point did that happen and how did that come to be? So after these two failed years, two failed startups, my dad, uh, who'd been a writer and he'd worked at some tech companies and been in politics and he'd been a lawyer, he was kind of uh, a perennial, I don't want to say dabbler because he's so smart, but he just done all these different things over the years. And he's, uh, you know, I say he's like a quirky guy in just the best way. Um, Like I said, he'd written a couple books and he'd been in politics and, you know, but he had this (laughs) totally random idea. Uh, He was just, again, very interested in commercial real estate in Washington, DC. Like every single building that you see is commercial. Right, so where your favorite restaurants are and your yoga studios and your gyms and even a condo building or an apartment rental, the way that they develop it is commercial. There's developers and architects and brokers and contractors and there's a lot of very colorful, interesting characters who buy the buildings and rehab them and design them and nobody writes about commercial real estate. So my dad just thought this is so interesting and he started publishing once a week to like a couple hundred people in his Rolodex, a weekly email called the Real Estate Weekly with no advertising. And so uh, after my sophomore year and after my two failed startups, I was talking to him and you know, he told me he wanted to try to sell advertising for it to maybe make some money because there was zero revenue and zero clients. And I said, well, maybe I could try to be the ad salesperson. So He said, yeah, sure, give it a try. I'll pay you 20% of whatever you sell. And so my first day, July 1st, 2006, I, you know, started cold calling and trying to sell ads for this newsletter. And I'll tie this all back to like this profound day I had where I made the decision to take a semester off from college that ended up being uh, dropping out of college, but it was done very thoughtfully. And... So I started selling ads. I had no idea what to do. I would cold call people and uh, they would hang up the phone. And, you know, over the few weeks and over a couple months, like I learned how to cold call. I'd say, hi, can I talk to, you know, Danny Miranda? And the person would say no and hang up. And I'd say, hi, who's uh, your head of marketing a week later? And they'd say, Danny Miranda. And I'd say, can I talk to Danny? They'd say, no. And they'd hang up. And then a week later, I'd say, hi, this is Elliot Biznow calling for Danny Miranda. And they're like, one second, right? So like I started to learn how to, you know, cold call, how to build relationships. I started going to, you know, various networking events at night. And meanwhile, now it's uh, the beginning of junior year of college. And I have classes, but I'm also now running a startup. And over the summer, I had, 
made about $30,000 of ad sales. So like the first sale, for example, was a $6,000 sale to the head of marketing of a firm called Jones Lang LaSalle. And the idea was we were writing about real estate. So people in real estate were reading it. No different than how people read a Buzzfeed or a Business Insider, right? It was like a daily email newsletter now. And then people would want to advertise. So Jones Lang LaSalle was a real estate brokerage firm. And I figured, wow, let's get your brand in front of these developers. They could hire you. So I went in, I pitched the concept, and I printed a paper that had a, a gold, a silver, and a bronze package. And I'd always heard, like, make the silver package really great because they'll say they'll really go for that one. It was $6,000. And um, I showed him the package and he said, let's do the silver one. And I said, great. He said, so just, uh, you know, what do you, uh, what are the next steps? And I said, well, look, you're the expert. Why don't you tell me what you'd like to see from me? Because I actually had not thought about what to do after you close a sale. And he said, uh, send me an insertion order. I said, absolutely, it's not a problem. And then when I got home, I looked up like, what is an insertion order, you know? And uh, it's, it's something you send. Um, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, so that was at six thousand dollars. I made twelve hundred bucks, and I was freaking out. Like in the drive home, I, I remember I wanted to call on my friends, but I was too embarrassed because I was now, you know, a millionaire in my mind. Like twelve hundred dollars. <laughs> like my life has changed forever. And um, but that was it. I did a handful of those, and so I went back to school junior year, and I was building my business. And I think I realized wow, like the goal of school is to learn as much as possible to pre prepare you for the real world. What I got out of school was two years of trying to build startups, even though they didn't work, a safe place to launch this third business with my dad. Um, I get to be away from home for the first time. And so one day I was walking to class and, you know, it's like a class that starts at 9 a.m., and I really loved walking to class um, because it felt like when if you've ever been to a college football game, like everyone's wearing the colors and they're all going in the same direction. You just feel like even if you're going by yourself to a college football game, you're like, you feel like in that moment you got like 10,000 um, people on your side, like friends, you can high five. And that was a little bit what it felt like to go to class, like just everyone was walking in the same direction. So it just felt... Good. It was like early and everyone had their coffees and it's not their favorite place to go. But there was just something about walking with literally thousands of people. I mean, it must be 5,000 people that walk to the 9 a.m. class on like a Tuesday. And I always liked it for two years. And so this one day I was walking to class and I like turned around, like I physically like turned, swiveled my head like as much as, and kind of stopped and looked back and like the sea of people just kept walking by me. And there's something about that moment, just seeing everyone walking in the same direction that I realized and like maybe went back to that conversation with that, you know, former tennis player who is now in the real world where it's like, wow, everyone's going in the same direction. And this is just one school out of hundreds of schools. And I'm just one person out of thousands of people at just this school. I'm one person out of hundreds of thousands of people just this year, if not millions of people in college this year, just in America, let alone decades and decades of people. And I'm, I don't have the best resume. I'm not the most impressive. Like I know what the answer is if I keep walking the same direction. I'm just a, a resume with a different name with lower criteria competing against all these people. And I know what the answer will be. I know where I'll be if I keep walking. And I realized in that moment, like the most important thing is that I just be different. It wasn't about, um, here's how successful I need to be. It was just like, I need to be different. So when I meet people, I have a unique story. I'm, I'm a human being. Um, they can actually connect and see I'm not just someone who followed the, the path. And so I turned around and I walked through the sea of people the other direction, something I had never done. I didn't go to class that day. And I called my parents and I said, look, I think I need to take a semester off. And, you know, I have, I came to school to be prepared for the real world. I think I'm prepared. I have a business with my dad. Like I wanna move back in to, my, to our house. I wanna to try to build this business and let's see how it goes. And if it doesn't go well, I'm open to going back to school, but I think that I'm on the path. Wild. 
something that stands out from that story is you were able to find beauty in the mundane. You were looking out at all those people and you're saying, that is amazing. That is wonderful. And like all these people going together is something almost spiritual or magical. How do you find beauty in the mundane? Because a lot of people will look at that scenario and not be like, wow, that's crazy. This is a wild experience. A lot of people do that often. But how do you think you've been able to do that in other parts of your life as well? I mean, that's a big concept that has to do with being in gratitude, which is one of the most important elements of our lives and well-beings and our states of beings is just in general, in general, having a mindset of gratitude. Um, not like, oh, I hope this podcast I'm on with you blows up and I hope he's a really good interviewer and what else am I going to accomplish today? And, you know, blah, blah, like instead it's like, wow, I'm really grateful that I get to sit with a really smart, interesting, passionate person like myself who's going to ask me interesting questions and I get to have a great conversation. I'm just grateful for that. I'm grateful that people want to listen. Um, I'm grateful that I got to wake up today. I'm grateful that, you know, the weather's, you know, crisp and cool. I'm, you know, and then it's like more simple stuff. Like I'm grateful I have a jacket to wear. And again, I think, you know, when everyone, you, when you're just running a hundred miles an hour, it can, you know, you forget gratitude. We all do, you know, we, there's more of a take mentality and what can I accomplish mentality. But I think, you know, trying to go through your life in a state of gratitude is really fundamental. Was there ever a moment when you didn't have that? Totally. I mean, I think all of us, like we grow up and it's all about accomplishments, mm. but that's the, that's the paradox, you know, um, you know, the best way to accomplish something is to be in a really good state where people want to work with you, where you're thinking clearly. And if you go through life in like, with a mindset of like, I want to get this, I want to get this from people. I want to, you know, you're always setting goals all the time. Again, there's a place for that. But when that's the total mindset of what can I accomplish? How much can I grow? What can I make? That's not the kind of person that people want to be around. And so the paradox is by actually not focusing on those things and being in a state of gratitude, appreciation, actually listening, seeing how you can help others, um, the things that you want tend to present themselves and that people that you want to do business with or be friends with or fall in love with want to be around you as well. You mentioned before we started about how you used to be someone who set goals very strongly and now you're not. What changed in that time? I think this concept, I think, you know, there is a place for setting goals. Um, but I think like everything in life, we can overdo it and we can push way too hard and be way too goal focused. And, you know, the path to building the most amount of subscribers for a podcast is not linear. And it's not just, a, you know, it's about, you know, actually, you know, the quality of the content and, you know, the relationship with the subscribers. And, you know, when you do that, maybe the growth actually hockey sticks, right? Where it, just meaning it can be f seem flat for a while, like the blade of a hockey stick, and then it can, you know, jump up into the right. So the goal isn't like, I need to 10x my subscribers every single year, right? The goal can be more on, I want to make sure, you know, I, you know, ha you know, spend more money to produce the absolute best content. And I want to, you know, make sure I actually connect with the subscribers I already have. And so I think when you shift that mindset, um, the results end up, they end up taking care of themselves. I know it seems cliche, but that's been my experience for 15 years. Going back to you and, and your dad, you said before that it, it was really difficult working for him and working in the business and that some nights you would come home crying and that was a very common occurrence. I'm curious why and then what what do you say to yourself in those moments when you're doing something for somebody that you love and it it's still a painful outcome well in the case of working with my dad 
it was really challenging solely for the reasons of the pressure of having to, you know, deliver the sales uh, to bring revenue to a business, which was my parents' only source of revenue for them, their only income, as they're in their 60s. So it didn't actually, in my case, it wasn't like uh, about it being hard to work with my dad. Um, he's like the nicest, most kind person. It was about that pressure. Um, it was also, you know, it's hard to have multiple types of relationships with someone. Like if, uh, <clears throat> you know, you're married, you know, it's hard to be their business partner and a parent and a lover and a travel adventure. And so it's the same thing like with your parents, it's hard to be, you know, a great, you know, daughter or son and a business partner and, you know, a shoulder for your parents to vent because they're now your business partner. And sometimes you just want to be their kid and them to be your parents. So it changed that dynamic, not for the fault of anyone else, but suddenly I wasn't just uh, their kid, I was their business partner, and I was in charge of all the sales and delivering. So it can be weird to have family dinner when you had a really bad sales week and nothing closed. Or, you know, if you, your parents think like, you know, you're taking personal time and they feel like you should be working harder for the business or if vice versa. And, uh, and so a number of things like that come into play where on the surface, it seems like a really great idea to work with a parent, but in reality, it presents a lot of challenges. And I think it takes like very, very mature parents and kids to work together. Um, I was not that mature at the beginning. I wasn't immature, but you know, I was not ready for that level of pressure. So it's just a challenge. It was just a, um, it was a challenging situation. Again, it was like beautiful because I got to be so uh, intimately involved in like my dad's work for the first time ever. So there's some beautiful moments, but overall it was really challenging. And finally, you know, different generations have different goals. Like uh, an older generation naturally may want to take the free cash flows and then be putting some away for their retirement because they realize they may only have five years left of income and that's it. Like they can't work after a certain age. And a younger generation may say, look, like I'm living on, you know, a friend's couch, uh, you know, not paying rent and my expenses are 400 bucks a month. Um, and I want to plow all the money back into the business and I want to grow it. And so there's also, you know, decisions like that where I think our, we were not totally aligned in what we wanted to get out of it. Um, again, we were very communicative, but it was, uh, it was, it was challenging and it, you know, made me mature quickly. What advice do you have for somebody who's working in a family business? I think it's very difficult and you should be very honest with yourself about why you're working in the family business. If it's the right fit, I have seen some very good family business dynamics that is possible. And, you know, mine and my dad's, it got easier and better over the years. Mm -hmm. But, you know, there's so many reasons why kids work in the family business. Like the parents really want to work with the kids. The parents want to give something to the kids that, you know, the kids want to, you know, actually get a nice role in a company rather than a menial desk job, right? So there's lots of reasons why people do it. But then, you know, reality can hit. And I think in most cases, it's very difficult. Mm. You know, you talking about how you're playing multiple roles when you're in a family business because you're the parent and the son, but then you're also the employee and employer and how that changes the dynamic. You've said before that people who don't know you see you for exactly who you are in that moment. And how I connect the two is I'm saying to myself, well, if you're going to a new business, you're, you have a blank slate, but your parent has all this history of who you are, what you're about. Um, so yeah, that, that quote really resonated with me and it really, it points to the fact that, you know, when we have new opportunities with new people, we can present a different version of ourselves. Yeah, there are some people in our lives who every time they see us, they're not looking backwards. They don't have rear view mirrors. They're just seeing us for how we show up that day. They have no grudges, no resentment. They, you know, 
They're just seeing you for who you are, Danny Miranda, today and how you showed up. There are not a lot of people like that. And so <laughs> I think in reality, you know, most people, you know, even when you, you know, you've been a successful restaurateur with three restaurants you own and a Michelin star, like most people who saw you as a line cook, you know, still can't get that out of their head. They may be resentful. They may think you're not that skilled. They may think it was a lot of luck. They may just, you know, they, they just, you know, some people just can't, you know, they, they, um, they can't accept it. And um, again, not everyone. There's some people who they just love it when they see you know you, you know, have successes or grow or mature. Um, like like my my parents have always seen me for who I am, and they've been amazing in this instance. Like they've, you know, they've always seen me for who I am that day and how I show up, right? And I'd like to think that's how we are. Like uh, whether you got in a fight with someone a week ago, like you're always giving them a second chance. You're always seeing how they show up that day. Um, the problem is like most people don't actually change. And then most, uh, and, and uh, so most people that you think, you know, here's how they could improve or can change or grow up or mature, they actually never do. So you keep kind of giving them second chances uh, and that they, they kind of fall short. And then, uh, you know, most people, because they have that experience of others, like tend to think people can't change. So, you know, most people don't change and then most people won't give people a chance to change. So it's, I'll just say, it's fun to meet new people. All, all that is to say, like move to a new city um, and meet new people and show up for who you wanna be. And then they just see you for who you are. Like I never met you before today, so you're just who you are. Why don't people change? My experience is that each of us have areas of our life that may seem difficult for others to improve those areas, but for us, those are the easy areas. Um, like for me, it's really hard uh, to do abs, let's just say. Uh, it's just like-, like I, core? Yeah, I just gym? like literally <laughs> can't even do three. Let, let's just say, okay? But some people, like that's super easy for them to do. They just, man, you just, that, that, that's in their nature. But for those people, let's say they have a, te a temper. Um, and that's like the obvious thing everyone tells them to change, but they just can't change it. Whereas for me, that's an easy thing for me to change. Like I used to be a bit temperamental and snappy and that was like when I realized it, it was just very easy for me to change that. And so I think that the, the problem is that we each have these blind spots of the thing we need to improve, but we either can't accept it or just, you know, don't even have the awareness. And so it seems obvious, like, you know, so-and-so needs to quit smoking or, you know, so-and-so, it's like they just, they're so frenetic. They're never grounded. Like, why can't they just be grounded? And it's like 50 years later, they're still frenetic and not grounded. Why can't they change that? But it's just, you know, generally the thing that we need to improve on is, you know, is very, very hard to change. And instead, that person's great at all these other things. And it's like, why? The one thing that you really need to improve on, uh, like you're unable to see that. And so from your perspective, where do you think you've grown the most over the past 10 years? I think I shifted from a very frenetic excitable, not great listener who was just go, 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 pushing, 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 not super enjoyable to be around, to a really good listener. I have a nice calm intensity to me. Like I'm still go, go, go excited, but it's, you know, very grounded, I think. Um, I think I'm very nice now which is something I actually have to work on. Cause I think, yeah, I, I think growing up, I was not like as friendly, um, I think. And then I would say just my favorite thing is uh, like, I really love helping and mentoring and giving to people. And that's not something I did growing up, but it wasn't something that I had to like force. It's just something that like, when I realized I could do that, it turned out that was my favorite thing. So I think that's probably the thing I'm most 
I most enjoy is just, you know, all the, you know, all the people who I have some way I can help them that I'm able to do that. How much of that was intentional versus unintentional? Just like wanting to mentor and help people? The growth. Oh, the growth. I think it was all intentional. I think I think I had a good awareness, but also because a lot of people were willing to tell me mm. how to improve, which is one reason I like mentoring people because I certainly didn't arrive to where I am because I went into a corner and thought about how to improve or thought about who I am. I, I improved because people took a little risk or some awkward moments and like, you know, called me or came up to me and told me how to improve, right? Like I had people who went out of their way, mentors, friends, people who came to our events, coworkers, like I, and again, I think I was a good listener, but I think a lot of people said like, Ellie, you know, you can't, you know, address someone that way. Hey, your emails are very curt and punchy and don't feel good. Or it doesn't feel like you went into that meeting and you talk the whole time. Why don't you try asking questions? Like, I don't think I had awareness. And I think a lot of people, you know, put effort into trying to help me improve. So I guess the takeaway is to surround yourself with people who are willing to confront you on your problems. Well, I've always loved the quote, you are the sum of the five people you spend the most time around. And I think for me, that is certainly what I enjoy. I enjoy friends who are not only willing to, you know, be open and true with me, um, but, you know, they're all, always striving for improvement as well. I mean, you know, everyone needs to choose what they're interested in. People don't need to surround themselves with friends who are into this. You know, they may just want friends who are good at chilling or you know, adventuring or wh what have you. But I think this is, I was always into self-improvement or I have been for, you know, since I was 12, like I was always into this, but it was in different areas. Like when I was younger, it'd be, how can I improve in tennis or, you know? And so I, th this, I was always into this. So I have always enjoyed um, listening to people and being a good listener. And uh, look, if you're not a good listener, it's very hard for people to give you feedback. Uh, like I'm sure that you've experienced some of your friends who you want to give feedback and you just, you can't even begin to fathom how to talk to them because it's going to be so difficult. It's just horrible. Be like, hey, John, so I wanted to talk to you and it's like, they're already angry, right? But then there's some people I'm sure you have in your life that are like striving for feedback. And it's like, hey, Danny, if there's anything you notice about how I'm podcasting or, you know, how, um, how you know, these emails look I'm sending or how I'm running this business, like, you know, if you saw me speaking, any feedback you have at all, I would love. And I mean, then there's literally people the opposite. Like you give them one note about how they're public speaking and they're like super offended. Yeah. Because look, the problem with feedback is implies you're not doing something well, which is a major ego check to most people. And so people, it's like, it's very difficult to accept feedback because it acknowledges like imperfections and flaws. Well, it's your actions. When you have ego, it's your, you're equating the actions you're taking to yourself. You're saying, I'm public speaking myself. So anything that I do in the, in the realm of public speaking, I can't change or it can't be different. But when you don't have the ego and you're open to the feedback, it allows you to become an entirely different person a year, five years, 10 years from now. One thing that you're phenomenal at is storytelling. Like, you might be one of the best storytellers that I know, and people might be realizing that from listening to this podcast already or listening to you on other podcasts. How do you get better at storytelling? Okay, well, the best storyteller in the world would be Dave Chappelle. Um, but I think the best storyteller around me would be Alex Benayan, who wrote The Third Door. And I think I did not appreciate the art of storytelling. I just thought people were good storytellers or not. And when I started out, again, 10 or 15 years ago, I just talked and didn't understand what it meant to attach a story. And the most important thing is not necessarily what you're talking about, but it's how you share it. Um, and again, that's why someone like a Tony Robbins is such a great storyteller. But what happened with Alex Benayan is he really put a lot of effort into learning how to tell stories. 
And again, sure, some people are naturally gifted, but for the most part, um, storytelling really is an art that allows you to take the subject matter which you wanna share and it allows you to take a story that makes it fun and exciting for people to uh, like follow and engage with and understand. And then, you know, to take the right story that naturally has like, whether it's comedy or tension. Um, and so one, one funny thing is like throughout my life when I'm having experiences, <clears throat> like Alex and I, we, we talk almost every day, uh, we're always sharing with each other like stories in the day and again, this is someone like another one of the best storytellers would be Jerry Seinfeld, right? And what's so great about him, like he can just tell these stories about these life experiences that we all have. So I think for the last 10 years, I've, I've really enjoyed telling stories. I've enjoyed listening to people who are storytellers. And I think the people, you know, that we enjoy who tell stories, they have put as much effort into that as uh, like a great musician would put into voice lessons or learning their instrument. And I just think it's not obvious because when we see someone with an instrument, we figure it took a lot of practice. But when we see someone telling stories, we don't think, oh, that took a lot of practice because they're just talking. And so I think the cool thing is like anyone can become a good storyteller, um, or even a good comedian. But again, when you see a comedian, because we don't normally tell jokes all day, we realize, we think, wow, they clearly put a lot of practice. But again, for stories, because they're just talking, it just doesn't occur to us. But all these people have really, really thought about it. And so, I don't know, for those of you interested in telling stories as you go through your day, just think of the fun stories or the fun adventures you have. And then um, there was a great book Alex had me read called stand like Lincoln, speak like Churchill. And, you know, it talks about, you know, you know, being able to change your, your tone and talk more quietly or be more excitable or how to power pause, which is an important thing to do. Uh, so yeah, I, I've just enjoyed it. Uh, I, I think it's, um, I think it's a, a an underappreciated and almost lost art form. Most certainly. W what separates a good storyteller from a great storyteller? I think a great storyteller, they, not only do they love telling stories, but they, they love capturing uh, as they go through their day, their experiences, and they kind of mentally log them down. Like, like, look, I am not a professional storyteller. I don't have a notepad, and I'm not like writing down my top 100 stories, and I prepared for this podcast with like, here's the 50 stories, I wanna try to hit four of them. Like, that's not what I do. I think I just kind of mentally log funny experiences and how those experiences have lessons in them. And then I can take like a funny story experience um, and plug in a lesson. And I also think that humor, most good storytellers are able to add, even Tony Robbins, like they're able to add a lot of humor, which is what keeps people like really engaged with the stories. So what happened the time you interviewed Kobe Bryant? Um, so we wanted to do a summit event in Shanghai and we needed a speaker and we realized that Kobe Bryant was, you know, on a China tour for a week because he's one of the biggest athletes in all of China. And so we reached out to him and said, Hey, we'd love your time for 40 minutes, you know, to do you know, to do an, to do an interview. And, uh, we were going to have like 500 professional, uh, like investors and business type people, professionals and investors at the interview. And so we really wanted, uh, you know, we really wanted to be, you know, presentable, serious. And we said, look, we'll, we'll book it at the hotel that you're at. So you won't even have to come very far. So somebody warned us, they said, listen, you don't understand. Kobe Bryant in China is unlike almost anything in the world. It's like, you know, if Justin Bieber went to a, you know, a mall in Iowa, like, and put it on social media. They're like, there's events Kobe's done, and by the time he's walked out, 25,000 people are outside. They're like, so even if it's a private event, if the word gets out about Kobe Bryant, 
like it's going to be mayhem. And so we hired security and we had a whole plan. And uh, what happened is people started arriving early and they were wearing basketball jerseys. And again, we, we like, you know, we've done events for a long time. Like people show up in like normal work attire. So people start arriving in literally Kobe Bryant jerseys, like the majority of the people. And we're saying like, no, this isn't appropriate attire. We're making people go change. So meanwhile, people are coming and it's starting to fill up. And we realize there's more, like, and when they come in, we gave them like these custom um, lanyards. Like we've gotten pretty good with lanyards where, um, you know, it's custom printed for the event. No one knows what they are. They have a special stamp. And, you know, that way we, we cinch them on their wrists and then you can come in and go out. And we've never had any problem with this. So suddenly we're being flooded with attendees, like way more uh, than we could fit. And we realize that, I kid you not, there were like these little mobile printing trucks that were ready for whatever lanyards there were and were on site printing fake, uh, not lanyards, f printing fake bracelets and, you know, I don't know if it was selling or giving them away. So we literally had to empty the entire venue. Um, it was it was pandemonium, like uh, like the amount of people outside, the people coming in. Um, anyway, when Kobe came in, it uh, like it, it was just get everyone to their seats, you know, hurry, hurry, hurry. Like Kobe's coming. Um, we had extra security come in and he, you know, he gets in. And he walks into the room when we introduce him and I, I did the interview and it's already like minutes of applause. Like you're like, okay, thank you, thank you. And like, you can't get people to stop applauding. And so finally they stop applauding and I'm thinking, all right, I can finally start the interview. And I say, all right, Kobe, you know, welcome to the stage. And he, go, and he goes, ni hao. And everyone stands up and it's like five more minutes of just over the top applause. People are going crazy. Everyone's got basketballs. I think the thing is like, we've just done so many events here with so many well-known people. There's a certain level of professionalism. Like, you know, even if someone's wearing t-shirts and jeans, like they're showing up five minutes before the talk, they're, you know, sitting, they have, you know, when there's questions, it's like, yeah, you have seven hands up out of 500. This is like 500 out of 500 hands up. This is like, oh, you know, you might have 20 people in the audience who want a photo out of 500. This is 500 people with telephoto lenses, like, and, or, or, you know, and iPhones. Like when he walks in, every single person has their hands up taking photos. Every single person has a basketball they want signed. Every, it was just, it was just raucous. It was just unlike any other uh, speaking, you know, engagement we've ever done. What does that, like, why do some people hit us so deeply? You know, I think, um, I think movie stars, one of the problems they have in the real world is that everyone sees them for their characters and everyone's been following them, especially if it's a TV series. You know, they've been following these characters for many years and then they just really, really relate to the characters. And so that's one of the reasons people so love movie stars. Same with musicians. They've just been listening to their music and their music got them through so many times in their life. They're, you know, this is their song at their wedding. This is their first date. This is when they went through a tough time. This is what they listened to. And so I think that people who have played like really outsized parts in our lives um, again, professional athletes that like provided us the inspiration when we saw how hard they pushed, it impacted our life. I think that those types of people that have really inspired us or gone deep with us or been like a profound part of our life, um, you know, they just, they, there's just so much love from, from us as like the fans. And I think that can be hard for those people because at the end of the day, they're just making music, they're just acting in a show. Um, and, you know, that's that's not the experience the fans have. The fans, it's like, this is everything. Who do you admire? You've met so many incredible people, but like out, out of all the, the people you've met or you speak to, like, is there anybody or a few that stand out of like, I admire this person? 
I mean, my main realization after all these years is, you know, every person in the world has a few things that are really uh, that are really interesting about them or that they're really good at. And uh, also when someone's like way overbalanced in one thing, like they're great at business, like you can't also be a great parent um, and in great shape and really present. Is it not possible? Not possible. Really? Yeah, maybe you could be two things, like a great business person, a great parent, but you're probably also not um, mentoring lots of people and, um, you know, you're not probably coaching Little League four days a week and you're probably not going on date night with your spouse three days a week. I mean, True. yeah, you can be a really nice person, but yeah, if you're on, uh, you're an amazing musician or on tour five months a year, then you're not with your family five months. Or if you are, then they're schlepping city to city. So yeah, no, I mean, you, you can only be a couple things. So, you know, I think for me, there's things I value, which are just like, I like being around like, really good energy, passionate people. I really love uh, healthy food, healthy living. I like people who create. That's probably um, my favorite thing of people is people who create with their hands. They're doing the creating, writing music, making art, cooking food, building structures. Um, that's like a lot more interesting to me than people who uh, like run businesses and manage teams. That's a form of creation as well. A different form of creation. I like non-computer office creation, I would say. Why? I just... Just personal preference? Yeah, I mean, I always liked Summit because we were building events. We are like, you know, there's a part of it, of course, that's on the computer, on the phones, you know, getting speakers. But ultimately, like, we're creating content sessions. We're building stages. We're building experiences. We're planning menus, we're serving food, we're hosting dinners, we're like, we are building physical experiences. So I always really liked Summit. Um, Powder Mountain, we're running a ski resort, we're building runs, we're building mountain biking trails, we're building homes. Like, I really like building and creating. Um, so stuff like chat GPT is like not that interesting to me. It, it's, it's, it's lightly interesting, but it's not something I'm super passionate about. It's like, again, the things I'm passionate about are people building things with their hands. People, um, I mean, I'm obsessed with people who um, have their own farms, mm. you know, planting trees, again, just creating. So to go back to the people like I most love spending time with, it's people doing those things. You know, somebody who, you know, moved to Costa Rica 20 years and built a permaculture homestead and planted exotic tropical fruits and trees or someone who just built a cob house or like I love chefs, right? Because chefs are by definition creating every single day the meals. And it's like, you know, it's art that I can actually eat, not just, you know, look at on a wall. Um, so I love chefs. Um, so I think it was like, it's like those types of people that I end up going, uh, really, really deep with, um, like my best friends are like a poet, a musician, um, you know, those type. Yeah. Who's the best example of balance or of the different components, like really successful in business or their, their creation, and then also really family oriented. And then also. Uh, like, is there anybody that stands out for, oh, this person is a, or these people? Well, we probably don't hear about those people because the way the world works is there's lists and the lists are about being as highly ranked as possible, which means uh, like you've achieved some maximum of something, like you've sold the most albums or made the most money as an actor, which means you acted in six movies in a year. And, uh, you know, or you've made the most money in business. Like it's, um, there's not any lists of like the Forbes 400 of balanced lifestyles, uh, right? It's like an absurd clickbait list of the Forbes 400 of richest people in America. It's insane, um, but that's what gets clicked. So in terms of balance, I don't think we hear about those people because they're, they're balanced. Like and they're, you know, they're not flying all over the place all the time. They're, you know, not working all the time. They're not maximizing the size of their business, right? They're, they're building like a business they really love with people they really love. And maybe there's 30 people that work there or 
60 people or eight people. Um, you know, they don't have 12 restaurants. They have one that they built for 10 years and then they built another one. So they have two, right? And so they've maximized like, and because of that, like they have it under control and they're, um, you know, have time for their family and time for their health and wellness. Like there was an absurd tweet we all joked about years ago and the tweet said, scale or fail, <laughs> you know? And it's like, uh, well, that's like one option in like growthy tech you know, um, but, you know, I think in reality, that's not an enjoyable way to live. It's like, all right, you've launched your dream restaurant. It's been six months. How are you thinking about your next 10? Hmm. It's like, you know, so again, I think that people live in really balanced lifestyles and that we should really, you know, should want to emulate or learn from. We all just meet them in our day-to-day -day lives. Powerful. Can you talk to me about your transcendental meditation practice and how that's played a role in your life? Sure. Well, I don't talk about uh, transcendental meditation TM that much because I feel like people think meditation is some um, like, you know, I don't know, religious thing or I, I, I don't know. It's just, uh, look, look, my experience, like I said, uh, I was really frenetic and go, 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 not grounded, 100 miles an hour. And I told this to somebody like 10 years ago. And they said, oh, you should meditate. And I was like, well, I've never meditated before. And they said, well, have you ever done yoga? I said, I've done it a few times. And they said, well, you know the end of yoga when you're laying on your back in Shavasana? I was like, yeah. They're like, so you know that Shavasana thing that's like a couple minutes long? I was like, yeah. They're like, that's basically what meditation is. It's like, instead of two minutes of Shavasana, you can do 20 minutes. And I was like, oh wow, that sounds perfect. I would love to do that. So that was my introduction to TM, Transcendental Meditation. So there's a lot of ways to meditate. I mean, I guess at its core meditation is just closing your eyes and sitting still and thinking or not thinking or whatever you want. But like that is kind of at its core what meditation is. And over the years, there have been, you know, lots of different meditation practices, um, a guided meditation on an app or a Vipassana, which is like a type of meditation where you go 10 days in silence. So I've never done any of those. So I've only done one meditation. So that's the only one I can speak to. But in TM, you know, instead of just sitting by yourself, like in a chair with your hands on your lap, they give you a mantra. And the mantra is just a sound found in nature. I don't think it means anything. It would be like, ohm. Hmm. So then you just sit in your chair and you close your eyes or sit on a couch. And then you just say the mantra in your head. But you don't just say it over and over like, ohm, ohm, ohm. You kind of start to like think it. And like, say, you're not saying it out loud. You just kind of like think the mantra. And then it kind of basically puts you into a trance and then the trance kind of puts you into that shavasana. Like uh, when you do yoga, you like finish this hard practice and you're all tired and you're all sweaty. And they're like, all right, now turn your head to the front of the room. Stretch those legs out, you know, flutter those toes, like stretch those arms out. And now close your eyes. If you have a towel, place it over your eyes. And then you're just like, ah. And then like, you don't fall asleep because you're not tired because you just did this hour practice be like close your eyes and you just kind of do this power rest sort of a thing where you're like awake but you're just like ah there's like nothing there but you're kind of awake so that's kind of what happens when you do tm you're in this kind of transcendental state and it's like 20 minutes long and sometimes you know uh you're you're present sometimes you're kind of like daydreaming but what starts to happen when you, you, and you do it 20 minutes twice a day, like the morning and the afternoon. And then what starts to happen is after uh, like even a few days and a few weeks and a few months, kind of like if you started going to the gym a few days a week, you'd get muscles. Or if you went running, you would get cardio. Uh, if I ever did abs, I would get some abs. Um, you know, if you do yoga, you can get flexibility. Like when you start meditating, uh, you start kind of changing how your brain functions mm. and uh, there's like a calmness that comes over you and uh, you actually start to change because uh, you're like sitting 
in this silence for 40 minutes a day, like really being peaceful, having gratitude. So that's what happened to me. I just, I really started to get more thoughtful, present, grounded, and it's been a great experience. And I would just say, uh, meditation is not something you can push someone to do. Like if you don't want to sit, it's like the worst experience in the world. It's like if someone's ever made you go to a yoga class, it's horrible. Like you have to want to go. Whereas like running, someone could make you go running and you kind of can get into the flow. Like you can't do that for meditation. So I think there's a certain subset of people who feel stressed, anxiety, like I said, frenetic. They want to like ground. Um, and for those people, uh, meditation and specifically TM are a really good option. Is there an example that comes to mind for how meditation has benefited you? Yeah, to I mean, just you're much more present and um, you see things in a non-judgmental way. And so you're able, again, some people naturally do this. I don't, um, but you are able to, again, when it comes to getting feedback, rather than feeling judged, you're just able to see yourself almost like from the third person and you know not feel judgment or if someone says something to you rather than like immediately reacting you may have empathy toward them and be able to understand why they are saying that um and so i think it 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 calms you down and it feels like you're a bit in slow motion mm -hmm. um you know and everything's coming at you and you can kind of slow everything down, take it in, and then respond. So the, yeah, the best examples would just be when there's heated situations or intensity around me, whereas normally I would just react like fire meets fire. Now you're able in a non-judgmental way, like if you, Danny, started just saying like, Elliot, why were you late? Like, I was not you late, early. I was early, of course. <laughs> um, but you're like, why were you late? You know, this is like really irritating. Um, and like, normally I'll be like, dude, stop, there's traffic. Like, well, you know, I think what happens is you actually listen, you understand, wow, like, you know, Danny was on time, he had the studio set, this is really important for him. It doesn't matter if there's traffic, I should have been more responsible, I should have left earlier. And you start to actually have empathy, understand other people, and then uh, you can respond and just say, I'm really sorry, that's a really good point. Um, would you mind if I shared like the, you know, even though it's my fault, the reason I was late is, you know, my, uh, my caddy, my homework, <laughs> whatever. So yes, those situations. And since those situations, Danny are nonstop all the time with our parents, with our friends, with our coworkers, like being able to be in this kind of grounded, calm, empathetic mindset is, is very beneficial all every single day. Why do you think that happens when you just sit with yourself? Because I've had the exact same experience. I think that if we didn't have technology and go, go, go all the time, I think we would naturally be closer to this state. But we live in a world where there's no time for anything. Like you're flipping through posts, you're flipping through comments, you're flipping through videos. If they don't don't hook you in five seconds, where so ever, so then when someone wants to talk to you, it's like I don't if the if you don't make your point in seven seconds, like I'm flipping through. I'm emotionally checking out. If you say anything like remotely like cutting to me or edgy, like I'm punching back because I don't have time. Like there's just. But the reality is we do have time. So I think that, you know, if we probably just went into nature for a couple of weeks with no phones, we'd probably naturally get closer to this state. Um, but then I also think there's some science to the meditation that, you know, can somehow alter our brain state in some way, whether, you know, I, you know, I'm, I don't know the science of it. Again, I just, Fine. you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not that into the quantified self, which is like all the tech, the law, the, all the tech stuff, the wearables, you know, I just, for me, it's like, how do you feel? Like try different diets, see what works. You know, I like, you know, take everything out 
and then add things back, see how you feel. I don't need to wear glucose monitors and, you know, again, wearable things I have, but this is what's worked for me is just being really present. And with TM, like it, it really, f I just never went down a rabbit hole of like, all right, what's the science? Like I just, it, it changed, it, it added like this light layer of calmness. Yeah. You've mentioned before that one of the things that you've bonded with your wife over is nature and being out in nature. And you just brought it up again, like being in nature is closer to a meditative state. What, what is it about nature that hits you so deeply? Well, the purest way that we can live is in harmony with the earth. Like, uh, you know, we're not cyborgs. So, you know, w whether it's what we're eating, drinking, like at our, you know, most natural state, we're like drinking, you know, water from the earth and we're eating, f you know, whole grain fruits and vegetables and, you know, not processed foods. And, you know, rather than sitting indoors under, you know, you know, um, you know, bright incandescent lights or whatever they're called, um, you know, that are blaring into our eyes, uh, you know, like being staring at screens all day, like these are not natural things. And, you know, they're a necessary part of our lives, but like at our like most natural state, it's like being in nature and, uh, you know, having our feet on the ground. It's like, again, I'm wearing shoes and I wear shoes like 95% of the time but it's like a more natural state to not have shoes on um, and to be on soil and, you know, to be in, again, in natural places around trees and with the wind and the sunshine. And again, we just, uh, we lose sight of that when we're in our day-to-day -day lives. And suddenly it's like, we're in all, indoors all the time, staring at screens all the time, eating processed foods all the time, never getting fresh air, never getting sunlight. And we've gone not just like a little bit away from our natural state, but like the entire way away from it. It's almost like a treat to be like, oh, I was outside and got a little sunshine or yeah, I was just like, you know, walking in a forest today or, you know, ate some really nice fruits today. Um, like that becomes like a rare thing to do. So for me, I'm trying to be you know, in somewhat of, you know, natural places, healing places as much as possible. And that's why I was attracted to Utah, for example, where I've lived for the last 10 years in a powder mountain, because my job is actually, you know, to, you know, look, you know, steward a ski resort. And like the thing that we offer people, by the way, what's so cool about, you know, being one of the owners of a ski resort is when people ski, that's like their best activity of the year of certainly of the week, of the month, like, you know, they go from their offices to they're on a mountain, you know, surrounded by pristine nature with the wind and the sun and the snow and the trees. And so it's like, that has been my job. I felt like at Powder Mountain to bring people into nature and, uh, and you know, give them, you know, peace and solitude, have them get to experience nature with friends. And uh, I've really, like, I've really loved that. And we, like you said, I mean, we just love trying to spend as much time as possible in natural places. How does money change you? Change who? Change human beings. Like how does having and accumulating money change people from what you've seen? I mean, the most common thing that happens when people make any amount of money is they join what's termed the rat race. And so there's different forms of the rat race but at, at its basic form, like you get a job after college making $42,000 a year and you're not able to save much. And so when you get to your next job and you're making $59,000 a year, you know, the extra 15 grand or so you upgrade your lifestyle, a little better apartment. And now you get a car. And then when you get your next job and you're making 75 grand a year, you upgrade again and then 89 grand and then, you know, eight years later, you're at 150 grand, but you're not saving any money. You're just upgrading your lifestyle. Now you're flying first class and you're living in a nicer house and you're doing more vacations. And what happens in the rat race is you end up having to work to support an upgraded lifestyle. And 
regard and the problem is Warren Buffett has a quote if you're not happy with x you'll never be happy with 2x and so what happens is that the rat race doesn't end when you start at 42,000 and then go to 59,000 and then 8 years later you're at 150,000 it doesn't magically end at 200,000 it just keeps going and going and going and so then people making you know eventually millions of dollars a year are spending all that money they're again not everyone but most people they are now have multiple houses they're flying private and so now they need to be you know they have very expensive lifestyles um like literally spending hundreds of thousands of dollars a month and then they need to work all the time and focus their business on the bottom line um to ensure the continuation of that lifestyle and Naval Ravikant has this amazing quote that people who live far below their means enjoy a freedom that other people busy upgrading their lifestyles can't even fathom. And so I think the vast majority of people are forever stuck in their rat race until maybe it's like retirement age and then they realize like oh my god like there's not more money or I'd want to stop working and they cut back all their expenses and they the, you know there's so many Americans living abroad in you know Costa Rica and Panama and Nicaragua and they realize wow I just want to live this really simple affordable lifestyle and have no stresses and they realize like I should have been doing this the entire time and so I think that's that's like a foundational way that money changes people it like puts them into this uh this kind of never ending rat race um but then of course you know you have you may have <laughs> had you know questions about like you know how does it change their personalities or emotionally or do they become different people but that that was the first thing that came to mind i, I like that you well you said before about the rat race it was an impactful quote for me because I've never really heard it like this the rat race, it can be when you work for an employer or it can be when you run a business. The rat race is when you don't make time for yourself. Yeah, I think it has, and part of the not making time for yourself is, you know, the business is just kind of constantly forced to grow, right? When a startup raises its first round of capital and those investors want a 50X, you know what's going to happen the next 10 years. It's going to have to grow. Scale or fail scale or fail because exactly so i think um you know it's it's hard to find uh a business setup and a life setup you know where you can work an appropriate amount of time and and you know by the way we almost snicker at people oh you only work 40 hours a week it's like well that, that sounds like a really nice balance but uh i think you know you know like any culture like you know, this entrepreneurial culture has been, yeah, kind of taken over by people who are just obsessed with like maximizing work, maximizing time, maximizing money. Um, I mean, there's so many problems with the, you know, Andrew Tates of the world, but like one of them, uh, you know, just the celebration of, um, of, you know, the high flying lifestyle and that everyone should want to, you know, again, so many problems, going to skip the obvious ones. <laughs> um, but the celebration of the high flying lifestyle, the cars, the planes, and that high flying lifestyle puts people into a rat race to afford that high flying lifestyle. When in reality, they're not happier, it's worse, um, right? What's better is actually a simple super affordable lifestyle, being able to save money and, you know, not having the stresses, um, you know, of, you know, the nonstop work. Did you have to personally experience that yourself before you understood it? Y yes. Everyone has to experience that. There is no other way. Yeah. So what was that experience like of thinking that you wanted the high flying lifestyle and then coming to a new conclusion i don't think i ever wanted the high flying lifestyle in I, that sense i like love I, the term by the way yeah like i've never been into uh 
the fancy cars or any of that. I think you know the difference between a porcupine and a Porsche. I don't. Well, with the porcupine, the prick is on the outside. <laughs> You know, so I don't know. Someone told me that that once I was, you know, I was like, I've always wanted a 911. You know, they're like, you know, the difference between a porcupine and a Porsche. I'm like, no, what is it? What is it? <laughs> um, you know, I think, you know, you know, look, it can have to do with um, with businesses like like, you know, over investing into growth at any cost and losing money to gain and build and build. And it's like, the reality is like, you need to build a good business and grow slowly. It's like, no, if we don't grow 50% a year, we're not investable. It's like, how about grow 12% a year and be profitable and put money in the bank. And I think we can do that for ourselves. So, you know, you can have, yeah, whether it's a high flying lifestyle where you're, you know, blowing money in Vegas or, you know, just, buying an extra house that seems like a good a good idea or you know spending money on friends or trips um and again everything seems because it's within your means that you know you can do it but then you don't realize okay well now i have to keep um i'm gonna have to keep the you know foot on the gas to keep producing income you know and i think you know that's an unnatural you know as a that's an unnatural state. That's not a great place to be, right? Like what you want to be doing is you want to be recording podcasts because you love every guest and you're doing it for all the right reasons, not because you've signed a lease for a summer home in the Hamptons this summer from you know June to August. And you're like, man, I need to crank out one extra episode a week, 50 extra episodes. And then I need to get like, I was going to turn down Chevron as a sponsor, but like now if they come on, they, I can this I ha, I've already booked the house in the Hamptons this summer, so I'll get Chevron. You know that's like the type of thing that like you know people make personal decisions that leads to putting them on an unenjoyable uh, work path. Yeah, no, I, I'm just curious from your perspective. Were you ever like, all right, I need this. I need like a fancy house or I need a certain type of experience and then you experienced it and you were like, all right, like that actually wasn't what I was seeking. I mean, I think every, I think most people have had the experience of like flipping through Zillow and, be, you know, and thinking, wow, if I only had that second home or if I, you know, I think it's nice to dream. Um, there's another Naval Ravikant quote that the opposite of wanting something is not needing that same thing. So you're like, you know, Danny wants a house in Hawaii more than anything in the world. But like the, uh, the inverse is just like, not only do I not want it, like it's uninteresting. So I have, and it's, it's an infinitely better state to get yourself to a place where you actually are uninterested in that thing. And it, it's, it's not easy to arrive there, but when you, again, it kind of comes back to gratitude. Um, but sure, have I you know, felt like I really want these things or I need these things? Absolutely, and if, you know, when you're earlier in your career, it's more simple things, like maybe to go to a restaurant you couldn't afford. Like I lived in New York City across the street from Nobu for four months and I never went to Nobu, not one time. It was, we went to this little, um, you know, what are the little shops called with the hot plates, the little, you know, on the corners, the bodegas. Bodega, we just yeah. got dinner at the bodegas every night next to the Nobu, right? So it was like, at one point it was like, I just really want to go one night to Nobu for dinner. Like, that's what I want to do. And I want to have like, you know, and then it just like keeps upgrading. It's like, well, I need this. Like there, you know, there is never an end to more. Like it never, ever ends unless we actively shut it down like maybe next time for our second podcast you'll be like elliot like the danny miranda podcast has been so successful that i spent 30 times more money on a studio and you know i'm blah 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 and we're actually on it you know whatever and it's like you know there's just never an end to more we always have eyes for more always have eyes for like bigger things i think that's part societal and social pressures that we feel like it impresses people. It's it's also the, you know impress ourselves. But I think we have to like actively escape that and shift to like this you know a much more simple life, which is really uh, 
you know, equally as joyful and infinitely less stressful. But how much of that is evolutionarily human, the want for more? And how much of it is societal? Meaning there were explorers that have been around forever. We, it's always been in our nature, it seems like, to be like, I, we need to see more. We need to experience more. Yeah, I, I mean, there's some elements of more that are healthy. Uh, like I want to, you know, I want to, you know, work out more or maybe, you know, do some more adventures or spend more more time with people I love. But I, and, and again, there's some elements of uh, pushing the boundaries. I just think we're currently in a time where there's so much of everything around us. Like there's just, it's an unlimited amount of everything you could possibly want at your fingertips. So it's like very different than even 20 years ago, let alone a hundred years ago. Um, you know, it's, it's just so different. Like every single thing we could possibly want is in reach and bookable with a phone call. And, you know, so if you have any extra money, then to see how easy it is to get any of these things, it's very hard to just say, you know, to have your mindset is like, I'm really good. I'm really happy. So I've shifted that along, like, I'm, I'm imperfect, of course, but like in general, I've tried for simplicity. Like I've decided I'm not into cars and I've had a 2016 GMC pickup truck since, uh, you know, since I got it. And I've decided like, I'm going to have that car at least 10 more years. Your parents loaned you the money for that car, right? Uh, that car is the one they loaned me money for. Yes. Because you put money into startups. Yes. And then to pay them back, I had to sell a hundred bitcoins for 20, <laughs> for $25,000. Well, that was in 2016. Um, uh, yes. Um, yeah, but you know, those decisions, like making the decisions, you know, uh, for me, like I really enjoy wearing simple clothes and, right. you know, simple beat up shoes. And actually for me, like, I feel like my clothes tell stories because mm. like I've worn certain shoes or a jacket or pants to like all these things I really enjoyed. So then I wear them. I'm like, oh, that's lucky jacket. Or, you know, rather, you know, I remember one year at ski season, uh, I was like, all right, well, season's coming up. I'm going to have to get all the, um, the, the new stuff for the ski season. The person's like, it's no different than last season stuff. I'm like, no, it's, this is the new year, the 2017 year. Um, they're like, it's just the same. It's just, you know, marketing. They're like, ski gear hasn't uh, evolved since last year. Uh, you know, so then I realized, wow, like you're totally right. You don't need new boots. You don't need new jackets. You don't, uh, you know, need, you know, so that that's something like I've, uh, I've really enjoyed. And like, I have a kid and there's a temptation to like keep getting them stuff. But mm -hmm. you actually, through the kid, you see it's like, wow, even though they think they want new stuff, like once the kid has had one present, he's four, like he thinks that like, can I have another? But it's actually really bad for him. Cause why? Oh, because then all he wants is new stuff and then he uses the stuff one thing and then wants a new thing. Mm. And so you end up wanting to like basically get rid of most of the stuff and then have him go deep with the things he has, like with the one, you know, rescue truck he has or the rescue helicopter, the fire truck, and then start doing stories with those. Um, so the only things we'll get our kid will be to little toys he can add to his stories. He's like, I really, really need a boat to do the story because like, I don't have a boat. And so that's a big problem because we can't do rescues, you know, in the ocean. We're like, okay, that's fine. Not like, oh, I'm gonna get you your seventh excavator. A lot of times we think that parents teach children things, but I'm always curious, what have your children taught you or child? Well, it's different so far in the first four years all the time. I mean, the first year was kind of like living with the Buddha mm -hmm. because the kid has absolutely no judgment. Um, everything is, they live in complete authenticity. Um, so the first year I just felt like I was living with the Buddha that, you know, it's just like, this is the most angelic, um, you know, person I've ever been around. This is what the Buddha is striving for complete presence. Um, I think recently, you know, just seeing, you know, what, you know, that whatever the inputs are into the kid, you can just almost immediately within, uh, days see the outputs, right? How, how we are, 
around them. If they, you know, he had his birthday and then it was just like by nature, everyone brings him presents and it was terrible. It's a disaster, right? Because he just, he got this overload of presents and doesn't understand that this is once a year. He's like, when's the next birthday? I'm like, in, in one year, he's like, how long is that? I'm um, like, well, one, two, three, four, like, I was like, counted to 30. I'm like, and way beyond that. He's like, no, 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 no. Is it tomorrow? <laughs> you know, I'm like, it's not tomorrow. He's like, is it the next day? You know, and then it's just like, he's like, you know, and then people would were late to the birthday and came a few days later and brought presents. And he just had like this week long of presents. Plus his birthday's right before Christmas. So it was just like this two week disaster of presents. And we tried so hard for like a year not to give him almost any presents. Like very little things is like good behavior. And then it was just this overload of like dozens of presents. And you could just totally see him change and become spoiled and right. And so I think, you know, it's just so important. Um, you know, the, like you can, you know, the experience he's having, he, he started a school that he really loves and I can see how impactful that is. And, you know, now being on his own seven hours a day, how he's able to mature, or we took him to, you know, see some dolphins. And then it's like, he'd never really been into dolphins before. And now just based on that one experience, he has so much love for dolphins. So I think just seeing like how important the inputs are. What are your inputs? What are, what's the the content that you're consuming or the things that are going inside of you mentally to, to help you? I think back in the day, um, back in the day, you know, I, I was just so all in with our team. It was work and life, but you know, when I was younger in my twenties, we all lived together, we worked together and the inputs were just this collective of like, you know, a dozen awesome young people, none of us who fit into, you know, the workforce and the real world. And, um, you know, we were a team in search of players as much as they were players in search of a team. Mm. And like, we really built this just incredible collective and the inputs were all these folks like it, you know, pushing each other and pushing and trying to achieve together. And then I think as you, you know, you go through your life, you, you change the people that you're around, you evolve, um, and you also see what your needs are and what you enjoy. And um, I think now, I think now the main, like one of the best inputs are all the kids that I mentor. Mm. That, um, and there's also adults, but I think I have a lot of people around the world who I've taken on that we talk all the time and I get to hear their experience of life and learn, in my opinion, you know, as much or more from them as they learn from me. Why have you gone so deep on mentoring? I think it's the same as people who choose to become teachers. They just really love sharing. They feel, you know, it's both an enjoyment, but also responsibility. Um, it feels very natural and that there's things that I spent so many years learning that, you know, I can help people understand these concepts. And, you know, so much of our lives, we're always looking for, you know, we're always looking to put our, to reach our hand up to, to get more to accomplish. And then, you know, it feels really good to reach your hand down to give someone else a leg up. And, uh, I think it also just keeps me really connected to the world. And, you know, there's just that the people are so diverse who I mentor and who I talk to all the time, just people I would never have, um, you know, any ability to have insight with, you know, people who live in Mumbai, India and in Lagos, Nigeria, in Toronto and Kansas city. And I mean, literally all, all over the world. How does somebody get mentored by Elliot Bisnow? I get a lot of emails um, from the third door since um, I'm basically described in the book as like, you know, the world's best mentor. So I get a lot of emails. And then if someone sends me a really thoughtful email, I will give, I'll reply back with a challenge. And yeah, the challenge will take like a, probably over a hundred hours. 
So they might say, okay, well, I wanted to reach out because I don't, you know, I, I read these books and I really want to be an entrepreneur, but I don't know where to start. Um, you know, do you have any advice? And I actually, one person I said, you know, great to meet you. Um, he was a 16 year old from a small town outside Berlin. And I said, you know, what would be great for you is to actually start a podcast and do 20 interviews. It can be people that are just your friends. Don't reach out to anyone famous and do 20 interviews. And when you're done, just send me a link to all the interviews. And so like three months later, you know, he sent me a link to all the interviews. And he was like, this is the best experience of my life. Like I had to reach out to people and get out of my comfort zone. And then I had to prepare questions. It's like, you know how much time 20 interviews takes, like hundreds of hours. So those are the kinds of challenges or I'll have people read books or, you know, I'll, you know, they'll share that, um, you know, they've never, you know, you know, left their, their country and want to go to a new place. So sometimes I'll PayPal people money, mm. like random people I never met and have them go on an adventure and then like update me for the next three weeks. I mean, all sorts of stuff, you know, there's always people all over the world, like going on adventures and doing various like, uh, like challenges. And then the people who, you know, do it and do a great job, like will stay in touch. And a lot of them I've just become really good friends with. And I mean, my main takeaway is that all the people who write me are, and it's so far been true. Every single one has been just like me. Wow. They're just great young people trying to figure out where they're going and, you know, trying to learn and need some pushing or challenges. Cause it can be, it can be hard to just be like, I'm starting a podcast. It's like, well, uh, this guy just told me to start it. Okay. I'm doing it. Or, Hey mom and dad, I'm going to go, you know, on a road trip, you know, down the coast of Brazil for three. It's like, are you crazy? It's like, well, actually I, somebody PayPal me money and challenged me to do it. Um, so there's, you know, there's just a lot of, uh, you know, there's a lot of great people and these young folks re reach out and, and look, it's also, you know, they'll send a really thoughtful email. I can tell that they're already like taking steps. It's like, it's pretty easy to vet. I'm not replying to like two sentence emails, um, but it's also, it's hard to find my email. So they'll put some effort into finding it. And then, yeah, like I literally have so many good friends um, from this experience. It's such a beautiful thing. You, you mentioned before that the mentees keep you connected to the world. In what ways have you become disconnected from the world? Well, I think they they keep you connected to a different generation. Mm. You know, there's ways that I'm more connected and there's ways that I'm less connected. So I think when you go to college, you understand what life is like in college. When you're actively using, you know, TikTok, you understand exactly what life is like on TikTok. Um, so I think they, they connect me to a, new, a different, gen young, generally a younger generation, but also just, I would say different. It's not that I'm disconnected, it's different generations. Like I have one of the people I help is a chef in Bali. Like, oh, wow. what do I know about Bali? What do I know about, you know, cooking? And so to be able to like see the dishes that he's cooking, to be able to, um, you know, experience the life in Bali you, and, and, and I go pretty deep, like, okay, well, what do these things cost there? How much is it to stay? You know, what are you learning? Um, you know, what kind of tropical fruits do you have? So it's almost like I'm getting, uh, like a front row seat to a, a, a course in, in, you know, in their city and in their experience. You, one part of what you're doing is asking questions and listening is like two key pieces of what you're talking about. What makes for a great question? Well, you're great at asking questions and it's weird for me to talk about listening and asking questions when I'm just talking the whole time. But <clears throat> one of the first challenges I'll give people is to try to not talk for a week and only ask questions. And if people ask them questions to interrupt, to just ignore what the person asked them and just to ask a different question. So I try to get people to do 90% or 80% questions for a week. But I think what, um, what makes great questions is listening to the answer and asking questions that follow that answer. And that's what we can learn from 
great interviewers like Larry King, right? And that is, at the end of the day, that is the foundational element to asking good questions is, you know, of course your first question has to be deep, but that, you know, good interviewers like Larry King, they just, they listen so deeply to what the answer is. And then they just continue to build off that. And they most importantly as well, follow subject matter that they are interested in and know about. So, you know, I'm not an AI expert, so it'd be really difficult for me to ask questions about AI. Whereas if you pick the subject matter that you're interested in, you can go, you know, really deep into that subject matter. That makes sense. Like if I interviewed the CEO of Google, it would be really hard for me to do a good interview about Google's technologies and like the, you know, the depths of the technologies, but I could do a fun interview about my experience with Gmail, Google Maps, what new features are coming to Google Maps, how does Google Maps work? Like this is all stuff I would enjoy. I could talk about his lifestyle and, um, you know, meaning his work habits and relationship balance and management techniques. But if I tried to, you know, ask about, all right, well, what is Google planning with AI? And, you know, tell me about the Google server farms like this, you know, so I think like knowing your lane with your questions means that anybody could interview the CEO of Google, literally, because we all use Gmail and Google Maps and Android and, as you know, search. And so, uh, like, we could literally all be qualified to interview the CEO of Google or the CEO of Netflix, if we stay in our lane. You've interviewed a lot of quote unquote successful people. Have you ever felt out of place? Yes, because I didn't understand this when I interviewed some people and I tried to ask questions I thought would be interesting that were way over my head and that the answers were so over my head, I couldn't build follow-ups. So I would, have to, I would ask a question, they would give an answer and then I would have to go to my paper and ask the next question on the list. And I did that for like 20 questions in a row. And it was just, there's one that stands out as just so uncomfortable for me. And that was really when I learned like, you know, ha you know, you have to ask subject matter that you have an awareness of and that you can continue the conversation of. Again, with Netflix, we've all watched so many of their shows. So um, we can talk about really fun subject matter, like, you know, what's your target audience and how do you pick the content you do? And, you know, what, you know, did the, you know, the best, you know, in, you know, last year and why, but if you start going into like really, really complex subject matter about film production budgets and, you know, stuff that I wouldn't understand, then the interview would be a disaster. Well, what was the one that, that really stands out? The one that stands out is that I interviewed Eric Schmidt when he was a CEO of Google. And I put a lot of work into the interview and I asked dozens of people, I mean, I put 30, 40 hours into the prep and I asked all my friends, what are the key questions? So I actually had this amazing list of, I think about 20 questions, great questions. I remember one of them, uh, they were just, they were, they were really deep. You know, how can Google's technology be used to solve our most pressing environmental problems? Mm. Like that's like a really good question. And then he would give these amazing <laughs> answers. He's so articulate, he's so smart. He knew the answer to every single question. The problem is when he explained how Google's technology could solve our most pressing environmental problems and what the challenges might be, I was completely unequipped to follow that on with another question. So then I'd have to say, okay, so now shifting gear, how does, and I just had to shift gear like 20 times. And so I think the interview from the audience perspective was, it was in front of like a thousand plus people. Like, I think it was fine. Like they got 20 really good answers, but it, you know, in an ideal interview, I would ask a question about like, all right, I'm in my city in Miami trying to use Google Maps to get here. Like, can you just explain to me, like, how do you have Google Maps in all these cities? Like, I've seen those cars driving around. Is that how you mapped it? Or can you just explain that? And then he would explain something that I understand. I'm like, oh, so do you have like these far away places on Google Maps? And 
Uh, like, where does Google Maps go from here? Can it ever get better? Or is this like the max? Like, so if I were to ask questions I understood, I could actually have like a fun sparring session and really go at it. And instead, I was just on my heels and there was not one question, I, as I recall, that I could follow up. Hmm. Yeah. Presence. Presence is the key. And you've said before about people like Eric Schmidt that the biggest takeaway from spending time with people like Branson or Bezos or Eric Schmidt is that none of these people have ever taken a cell phone out in front of you. I thought that was a fascinating insight and speaks to presence, right? And the ability to be where you are. Yeah, I think Bezos is the person who never took a cell phone out, not one time for an entire day that we were mostly together at an event. I think the others have, but for the most part, they, they seem to be extremely present. And I think what I realized is they have thousands of times more important things they're doing, more people reporting to them, just more stuff happening than I do, but they don't take their cell phone out. So why do I take it out all the time? And it's not because I'm doing more important things. It's because they're managing their lives better. Mm. What do you feel like you've mastered and what do you feel like you're still learning? I don't think I've mastered anything. Uh, I think uh, that's kind of a cliche answer. What, uh, I think I'm really good at mentoring. Not a master, but I think I'm really good at mentoring um, a certain type of, of people, uh, a certain type of person, kind of entrepreneurial people trying to figure out, you know, where they want to go in their life, kind of like I was. So I think that's probably one of the things I'm the best at. And what do I want to keep learning? Um, You know, I think, you know, I've always loved uh, just like our food systems and, you know, what we eat uh, and how it makes us feel. So I think just keep learning about food, cooking food. Um, I really have always loved gathering people and hosting. That's something else. I think we, you know, after hosting hundreds of events, like we became really good at. So I think also, you know, food, community, gathering people over food, cooking the food. Um, I think, you know, would like to, you know, keep improving my own health. I think that's always at the top of my priority. How do I feel? Again, what am I eating? Uh, I think I'd like to just keep getting better at listening getting better at asking questions. And then, yeah, I think last thing, just as a parent, you know, that really changes your lifestyle and you become a lot more set in a place for most parents. Like most people don't throw their kids in like, you know, slings on their back and just travel around the world. Um, so I think, you know, breaking out of our comfort zone with our kid, you know, we have a good flow, but as a parent, um, you know, it really slows you know, down a lot of the experiences. So you do different experiences through different eyes, but I think stepping into that is like uh, something I'd like to get better at. That's cool. On, on gathering people, a lot of people, we, we want to come together and I want to help bring people together. What should somebody think about if they're hosting a party or hosting an event of a small scale, let's say it's 10 people, what's something that they could do or what are some tips from doing it so many times? Yeah, I think that if you're gonna do a dinner, eight or less is an ideal number. As you start to creep up to 10 and more, it gets harder to hold a, din a, a, a table conversation. Hmm. So if you're talking about like a dinner party, under eight is ideal, even six. Um, I think that Cooking the food rather than getting takeout is really important. I think inviting people over to help cook is really important. Not everyone will want to, but even getting three or four people put on some music in the kitchen and you're all there for an hour, hour and a half, chopping, cooking, collaborating, like super duper fun. And uh, and then, you know, being able to 
hold a one table conversation is the most important part. Like the worst thing of a dinner is like you just talk to the two people next to you. So you need to be able to say like, thanks everyone for coming. I'd love to do a table conversation. And I wanted to start with a question for each of you. Um, you know, what are you, what are you grateful for that happened to you last week in your life? You know, and being, and then you go around and there's a really powerful um, energy that happens when you do that. And then you can kind of read the room. If it's like a deeper group, you can keep going deeper. Like, you know, what are the, what, you know, going on the next question, like what, what are you most grateful for that each of your parents taught you? You know, again, but you could also do a, a, a different theme that could be more fun. Um, and so I think being able to ask those questions and again, even simple ones, like what are you most excited about for next week? You know, that that's, and again, it just lets you, you know, connect to each of the people. And um, yeah, so holding a table conversation is the key. That's super helpful. I like to end these podcasts with a challenge for people listening because you take in all the information, you consume it, but then you leave the podcast, hopefully with a challenge to change something, to take some action in your life. Does a challenge come to mind from anything we spoke about or anything that we haven't? Yeah, I have unlimited challenges, but I would say since you, Danny, are great at asking questions, I would give everyone the 90% question challenge for one week, not three days, one week. And the challenge is that for the next week, starting now, um, try to make 80, uh, try to make 90% of what you say a question. So, and try, and what you'll find is uh, the quest, your questions will get better and better and better. So do not ask reporting questions like, so how's the weather? Like, how was your lunch today? What's your plans tomorrow? Try to ask in an authentic way, good questions. When you see people, you know, what are you working on? And then listen and then ask follow-up questions. Oh, why are you working on that? Or, you know, who's helping you with that? Or, um, you know, what are your plans for the week? But then listen to their plans. You know, and why are you doing that? Have you thought about doing this? So try to ask 90% questions for one week. And if someone does not answer the question or ask you a question, subtly ignore their question and ask a different question. I love that so much. I'm going to link below my list of great questions that I keep in my phone so that you can check those out and see if they align with you and maybe insert them into one of the questions you asked for this challenge. So. This has been awesome. I'm incredibly grateful for your presence, for the stories you've shared and, and all the information. Thank you so much. And is there any place you'd like to send people to connect with you further? Mm, no, you can just find my email address somewhere and reach out if you find it. <laughs> I love it. Elliot, thank you so much. All right. Thanks, Danny.